Uh, good morning, and thanks so much for coming today. Um, I think we've heard both from what Marissa Walls uh, described earlier and from what Dr. Corlett just told us about what psychosis is and something about the experience of people uh, who have these symptoms. And what I want to emphasize is that psychotic symptoms such as hallucinations or delusional beliefs uh, or thinking difficulties are remarkably nonspecific. They occur in a variety of psychiatric disorders, exactly as Dr. Pittinger just told us about. These can include schizophrenia, some forms of bipolar illness, schizoaffective disorder, some forms of severe major depression. And exactly as Dr. Pittinger described, what we want to do is to find the mechanisms behind these things in, in the way that Dr. Corlett is doing, but also see to what extent there are psychiatric diagnoses that are real world in the sense that things like heart attacks are real world disorders. So really what I want to tell you about this morning is how we think about these things as a background to describing the research that we've done in my group. So um, for the two people out there in the audience who are interested in what I have to say, um, <laughs> you can look in the annual review of clinical psychology a couple of years ago that describes some of what we're doing in mind-numbing detail. <laughs> so uh, the things I want to talk about this morning are that there are troubles in psychiatric diagnosis land. And really what we need to do is go all the way back to Emil Kraepelin, who was a German psychiatrist in the 1890s, who first came up with the ideas that we use today about psychiatric diagnoses and really separated for the first time um, schizophrenia from bipolar disorder, for example. He made that crucial diagnostic distinction. And what Kraepelin always hoped is that biology would later validate his diagnoses. So patients with schizophrenia would have one set of uh, changes in their brains, and patients with manic depressive illness, bipolar illness, would have a completely separate set. And he was well aware of heredity and the fact that these illnesses ran in families, and his ultimate hope was that the genetics would be different, for example. And so the first question our research group is asking is, does biology, in fact, validate Kraepelin's essential distinctions. And if not, can you use biology for some other purpose? Can you use biology to throw these diagnostic distinctions or set, throw them away or set them aside and come up with a, a, a new way of reconceptualizing psychiatric diagnosis? Um, and w we've tried to do those things in a, in, in a project called BSNP. It's the Bipolar Schizophrenia Network on Intermediate Phenotypes, which is a mouthful. But I'll explain to you what intermediate phenotypes or endophenotypes, as they're often known, are, why they're important. And what we came up with, where this will lead to, is what we call biotypes, which are just biologically defined uh, mental disorders. So a major problem in psychiatry, exactly as Dr. Pittinger said, is that we don't know the cause or the origin of psychiatric disorders. We know a little bit about things in the brain like dopamine. We know a little bit about learning, but we don't know the basic cause in the way that we know the cause of a heart attack. And just what we're dealing with then is, is syndromes, which are just loose collections of either things that patients tell us, like I'm very depressed, or I hear voices, or the long-term causes of those illness if people recover in the long term, and to what degree? How chronic is their illness? And as McHugh and Slavny have said, identifying any disorder by its symptoms doesn't translate into understanding it. All it is, all we're doing is describing it. And that, that's remarkably like where medical diagnoses were in the 18th century. So they had the, what they thought then was a disease that they called dropsy, and dropsy is e easy to diagnose. It's just accumulation of fluid in your lower extremities. And anyone can reliably diagnose dropsy. All you've got to do is sort of poke grandma in the shin. And if, when you take your finger away, if there's a deep pit, she's got dropsy. And it has high diagnostic reliability. And th there's a partially successful symptomatic treatment for it. So William Withering was told by a Shropshire witch 
in the 1700s, give people foxglove leaves and their dropsy will go away. And that's true if you have congestive heart failure, which is one cause of dropsy. But if someone has liver disease or mountain sickness or protein deficiency and you give them digoxin, you're more likely to kill them. So what we needed to do, what medicine needed to do, was figure out that dropsy is just a syndrome. It's a collection of symptoms. And that it really consists of a set of symptoms that can occur in many diseases which have unique causes one of which is heart failure. And then once you can dissect it in that way, you can find the correct and beneficial treatment for each of those diseases. And that's the way medicine happened from the 18th century on. So, I mean, not to belabor this point too much, but if you go to your general medical physician and say, I've, been, I've had a chronic cough that's been bothering me for three weeks, or three months, let's say, then the doctor will take that seriously and do some diagnostic tests. So they'll, what they'll, your physician will do is basically use biological measures to try and identify the cause of your chronic cough and find an appropriate treatment for you. So that might be to take your temperature, do a chest x-ray, look at some of your sputum under a microscope, take a blood sample, have you blow into a spirometer to measure how much breath capacity you have, do a, a CT scan of your chest. And that way the doctor will figure out if your chronic cough is due to bronchitis, or asthma, uh, or tuberculosis, or lung cancer, and give you the appropriate treatment. But you wouldn't want to go to your doctor and say, I've had a chronic cough for three months, and have your doctor immediately give you chemotherapy, or give you treatment for an antibacterial drug for tuberculosis, before they knew what the underlying cause was. So that's just to kind of emphasize this point. But unfortunately, as psychiatrists, we don't have a handy brainoscope that you can stick in someone's ear and make an instant diagnosis um, because the brain is complicated and we really don't understand its mechanisms, which makes psychiatry fascinating but makes it very, very deeply frustrating both for patients and for practitioners. So maybe an analogy is having a heart attack. So if, if you show up in the emergency room and say, I'm having horrible pains in my chest, it feels like an elephant is sitting on my chest, I can't breathe properly, then what the physician is likely to do is to take an EKG and to draw a blood sample to look at cardiac enzymes in your blood. And as a result of those biological tests, the doctor can say to you with some certainty, you're having a heart attack, we're going to admit you to the heart service and monitor you very carefully, or you put an extra dollop too many of hot sauce on your burrito, you've got really bad indigestion, go home and don't bother us. And we know the underlying pathophysiology, the underlying um, cause and biological abnormality that underlies having a heart attack, which is basically a plumbing problem. Your coronary arteries are gunked up um, with a plaque, which ultimately impedes blood flow and when that gets bad enough, you actually have a heart attack. And that's on a continuum. So you can ha have all the way from squeaky clean arteries to completely blocked ones. And the way we figured out about the underlying causes of what causes that sludging up and blocking of arteries is to look at risk factors in big epidemiologic studies like the Framingham study. So the risk factors are hypertension, uh, type 2 diabetes, um, high levels of lipids, fats in your blood, and being overweight, as well as environmental factors like smoking. And each of these factors, like hypertension or cigarette smoking, has a genetic basis. So even these behaviors, as well as these physiological uh, differences, have an underlying uh, genetic basis as well as a behavioral one. And there are different kinds of risk factors. If you have black lung, risk factors you have are purely environmental, working in a coal mine, and n not at all genetic in any way. But what we're interested in is genetic risk factors. So a plan to help figure out diseases and dissect something like dropsy or something like schizophrenia is understanding how all of these different risk factors interact in their complicated ways to produce a heart attack. And what, what doctors in medicine have done and what we've done in BSNP is just to take the risk factors one at a time, 
try and figure out what's going on with each of them in a sort of simple-minded way, and then to build all of that information together. So many risk factors for heart attacks, like type 2 diabetes or hypercholesterolemia, run in families. So they're presumably at least partly genetic. So eating Big Macs is part of it, but having a high baseline cholesterol, because everyone else in your family does, and it's genetic, is also part of it. And many of these risk factors are found to lesser degrees in unaffected family members. So if I show up in the emergency room with a heart attack, and everyone else in my family that doctors would um, image using um, a CT scan of blood flow in their hearts would m more likely be on the abnormal end of, of a spectrum. And what we call these risk factors that are heritable and genetic in, in origin is endophenotypes. So they're just heritable risk markers for predisposition for a disease. They're not biomarkers of the disease, they're biomarkers for risk for the disease. So you can study unaffected family members um, which is an important aspect of this. So for example, high blood lipids are one factor for heart disease. They tend to run true in families. So if I have high cholesterol, my first degree relatives probably also have high cholesterol. Therefore, researchers at Yale, several like decades ago, looked at the genetic basis for hyperlipidemia and they found it. And they found a drug that interfered with that genetic predisposition a biological mechanism. So if any of you are taking a statin medication, like Lipitor, uh, that all stems from that study. So that's, that's an important example of what I'm talking about. So the criteria for an endophenotype, it's, you could, it's quantifiable, you can measure it, it's reproducible, if you measure it twice you come up with the same idea. And it could be anything from a cognitive test to a blood lipid level. It's associated with illness in the population, so if it's abnormal, the more abnormal it is, the more likely you are to have a, that illness. It's heritable, so it runs true in families. It's state independent, so if your illness gets better, the biomarker doesn't go away, because it's not an illness marker, it's a risk marker. It's found in some of your unaffected relatives, more than in the general population. And it's not associated with treatment. So if we developed a test for bipolar illness that just measured your response to having lithium in your blood, then that would be a useless biological marker because it would be a marker of the fact that you'd been treated with lithium, not the fact that you actually ha really had bipolar illness. So it's important to sort those things out. So what are endophenotypes for psychosis as opposed to heart attacks? So the, the very first biological abnormality that was recorded in schizophrenia was back in 1908. And a, a couple of doctors in Connecticut in a state hospital just got patients who they diagnosed as schizophrenia to watch a simple pendulum moving from side to side. And they noticed that schizophrenia patients, when they followed the pendulum, had slightly jerky eye movements. Nothing very pronounced, but enough to be notable to them. They were able to photograph it with primitive photographic apparatus. And this was years before there were antipsychotics, and there were no specific treatments for schizophrenia, so it obviously wasn't a, a treatment side effect. And then Phil Holtzman at Harvard uh, in the 1960s and 70s found that the same abnormality ran in families, so patients, fa unaffected family members of people with schizophrenia had exactly the same jerky eye movements, although they haven't, didn't have the disorder. So that's a classic endophenotype. So the implications for psychiatry are that clinical psychiatric diagnoses often overlap massively in terms of symptoms. And that this complicates our understanding of cause as carefully describing symptoms, like carefully describing symptoms of cough or dropsy, doesn't get you much further than saying this person has swollen legs but we don't know what the cause is. So what we want to do what our group is trying to do is to validate biomarkers to get biosignatures for psychiatric disorders. So an important question is where do our psychiatric syndromes, and they are syndromes not diseases because we don't know the causes, is this guy Emil Kraepelin. And he was a psychiatrist in Germany in the 1890s 
He was an endlessly inventive person, and he was someone who was persuaded by new data and persuaded by his residents when he said something was wrong, he was willing to change his opinion. So he's the opposite of what we think of Germanic. He was actually pretty flexible. <laughs> and his brother ran a museum and was a, a natural biologist. So there's a bunch of snakes and lizards and scorpions uh, that are named after Kraepelin's brother. And Kraepelin sort of worshipped his elder brother and in some ways wanted to be a systematic biologist of mental disorders. The trait kind of ran in the family. And Kraepelin was pretty sure that his, the disorders that he delineated, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, we now call them, uh, would turn out, as I said earlier, to have biological causes. But there are problems with Kraepelin's division. So about 40% of patients with bipolar illness have hallucinations and delusions during periods of illness. Um, few patients are typical. Patients don't read DSM in their presentations. <laughs> so some otherwise typical bipolar illness patients have chronic progressive courses, and some otherwise typical schizophrenia patients show very good clinical recovery. And Kraepelin's foundation was that bipolar patients get better and may have another episode, but they recover completely, and patients with schizophrenia tend not to. But his uh, resident, Zendig, back in 1909, said, Herr Professor, excuse me, but you're wrong. This doesn't happen this way. So Kraepelin got flexible, accepted that. The other problem is that cases that are hard to classify, which is many cases, are not included in clinical trials. So people who are in clinical trials for treatments tend to be classic cases, and the many cases that are in between, what are often called schizoaffective disorder, for example, which is a sort of diagnosis of we can't really decide if you have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, are omitted. So they're non-representative. Um, there's also diagnostic crossover. So if you ignore the rules in DSM-3 or DSM-5, then about a third of schizophrenia patients ultimately meet criteria for major depressive disorder. So that's a big problem, saying, well, they have one illness, but they, by the way, a third of them also meet criteria for a completely different illness. Another problem is that, as Dr. Pidden just said, you'd expect to be able to carve nature at its joints. So you'd expect a group of patients with bipolar illness over here, <coughs> group of patients with schizophrenia over here, and a big gulf in the middle, so the d clinical distinction is easy. But it's absolutely very difficult rather than easy. Um, there's also overlap in familial expression, so it's easy to find cases of people with schizophrenia where their affected, other affected family members have bipolar disorder and vice versa. If these were classic diseases, you'd expect them to run true, and they don't. Uh, both diseases are highly heritable, but when um, geneticists have looked at the risk genes, the risk genes for bipolar disorder overlap to a huge extent with those for schizophrenia. And measures such as neuroimaging and EEGs are abnormal in many of these disorders, but the abnormalities also overlap. And so do treatment modalities. If you have a patient with bipolar disorder and you give them an antipsychotic medicine, whether or not they have psychotic symptoms, they'll tend to respond and get better from that. And that doesn't make sense on a lot of levels. So the question is, why is this Kraepelinian dichotomy between schizophrenia and bipolar illness survived as long as it has? No. The honest answer to that is because we've not come up with anything better. And that's a problem. So the origins of BSNP kind of capitalize on this. Uh, since Kraepelin said biology would validate his diagnoses, we set out to try and do that. And the main aims of BSNP were just to build a multi-site, multi-phenotype, multi multiple biological measure approach to study three psychotic illnesses, that is schizophrenia, bipolar illness with psychosis, and schizoaffective disorder, using exactly the same equipment at all sites, and human phantoms that travel between the sites so everything 
all the measurements we know are the same. Um, and we picked 50 different well-validated measurements ac across EEG, different kinds of eye movements, remember that 1908 study, cognitive measures, brain structure and brain function measures on MRI, the, the sort that Dr. Corlett described, plus very careful characterization of symptoms in clinical course, and we genotyped everyone's DNA. So these are the um, BSNP usual suspects at different sites uh, throughout the US, one of which is here at Yale. And the, the genotyping was done, first of all, in Connecticut by Gualberto Rano, uh, who used to be here at Yale and moved to Hartford Hospital, and by the Broad Institute um, in, in Boston. So I already said this. Um, we recruited 2,500 people, so you can see the patients on, on the one side with these three different disorders, about 500 healthy controls from the community, and for each patient, since we're interested in endophenotypes, we also recruited at least one of their first degree unaffected relatives to see if these biological markers truly did run in their families. So the overarching question was whether Professor Kay was correct that particular endophenotypes would show sharp divisions between these three different disorders. So this is in your handout. I won't say what each of the individual measures was. Um, but the idea was that these different measures that you see here uh, in gray, like brain structure or electrophysiology, would cluster together and sort themselves differently in different psychotic illnesses. So what I want to tell you about is just spend a couple of minutes talking about one endophenotype, <clears throat> the auditory oddball P300 event-related potential, which is often called the P300. So the basically o basic auditory oddball paradigm is you have a bunch of EEG electrodes on your head, 64 in our case, to measure electrical impulses from all parts of the brain. And you have on a pair of headphones, and you just listen to beeps. And the beeps go something like beep, 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 beep. So every so often, there's a so-called oddball beep. It's just called oddball because it's different than what you're expecting. And in response to the oddball beep, your brain fires off what you might call a surprise wave, 300 milliseconds after you hear the oddball. So the, this is a classic paradigm, and the paradigm is one of these things is not like the others. And it was first described by Bertram and Ernest in the Journal of Sesame Street <laughs> Studies. And as, as p patients are as quick and accurate as healthy subjects to identify the oddball. They have no problem saying that this beep is different than the others. But their P300 tends to be just maybe 10% lower in amplitude than those of people without a psychiatric diagnosis. And this is someone like a healthy volunteer wearing a cap or a patient. And the paradigm is so simple, you can actually do it in infants. Uh, infants have a P300. And the response is there for a reason. If you're walking through the woods in Connecticut and the twigs are going crunch, crunch, crunch over your, under your feet, and suddenly there's a different kind of crunch from behind a bush, your brain says, hey, pay attention, something different is going on here, what is it? And I think in evolution, it's, this is a very highly conserved response, and those of us who lacked it ended up being tiger breakfast. <laughs> and P300 is conserved across the entire mammalian kingdom. So you can m measure it in mice and rats as laboratory mo models. And one of our um, more confident um, postdocs in years gone by went to the uh, Mystic Aquarium uh, equipped with a single EEG electrode the size of a toilet plunger and got the permission from the aquarium to stick it on the head of a killer whale <laughs> and gave the killer whale oddball beeps under the water, like click, 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 click. And sure enough, the killer whale shows a P300 response. 
So it, it, is, it, does, it is something fundamental. And it's abnormal in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. It's abnormal in their unaffected first degree relatives. It's abnormal in people who are first developing prodromal symptoms of these illnesses. It's abnormal in first episodes, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, it's abnormal in other disorders. It's very nonspecific. It's not really affected by drug treatment, which is good. It probably has something to do with dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain. There are animal models for the reasons that I just told you, and it runs very reliably in families. If I have a small P100, then my brothers and sisters are more likely to have small, small P300s too. So back to BSNP. So the first thing that we do, did is just to look at clinical sim symptoms across patients with all of those three disorders. Psychotic bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. As you can see from these graphs, on all sorts of different symptoms, including symptoms supposedly of mania and major depression, all three groups were pretty identical and not significantly different. So we invented a schizobipolar scale. A schizobipolar scale on one extreme had patients who had classical schizophrenia. On the other end, we had patients who had classical bipolar illness. And um, what we did is score each one of our patients on that scale. And we thought we'd find three distinct um, spikes with, with wide separation. And in fact, what we found is what biostatisticians call a schmear. That is, <laughs> everything was spread out across the entire graph with no points of rarity at all. So, so much for carving nature at its joints. So, what we then did is to look at all of the endophenotypes, all 50 of them in all subjects, and to see to what extent they hung together with classical Kraepelinian diagnoses. And the, the, the basic bottom line, and we've published papers on each of the endophenotypes, is that these biological measures do not reliably distinguish one of those illnesses from any of the others. Sometimes one illness has a bit more of one thing and a bit less of another, but if you tried to sort out the patients based on their endophenotypes, you'd, you'd do about as well as chance, is the way it comes out. So here, back to the auditory oddball, if you look at the thing that says um, targets, you can see over on the left-hand side, there's a sort of black line on the top, and then a gray area underneath. So the black line is what healthy controls are doing, and the blue and the red lines underneath are what uh, patients are doing. So the patients are score, have lower P300s, exactly as everyone said, hundreds of papers through the year. But they look very much like each other, and the P300 doesn't distinguish them very well at all. So th that was true for all 50 of our end endophenotypes. There were differences in degree among the different diagnoses, but they, they were pathetically bad at sorting out patient groups one from the other. So wh what we did is go back to square one and say, OK, if this doesn't work, we'll set aside all of these DSM diagnoses. We'll essentially throw them away. And what, what we'll try and do is completely reclassify all of the patients just based on the biology. Forget about clinical symptoms and diagnoses. Just use the biology and try and classify patients from the bottom up. And an obvious parallel for this is the way breast cancers have been uh, reclassified into 12 different diseases in, in the last few years based on their genetics and molecular biology. So one major conceptual trap to avoid is to go, not get into circular reasoning, trying to relate biological measurements back to familiar diagnoses like bipolar disorder, where you have to exclude the unclear cases. We just said, throw away the biology, start from the bottom up with, um, st throw away the clinical diagnosis, start from the bottom up with uh, biology. So the way we did that, and not to get into too many details, first of all, we compared all of the patients to all of the healthy controls. So we set the relatives aside and said, which are the best end endophenotypes that clearly distinguish patients from healthy volunteers who don't have a psychiatric illness. 
So that tended to be a handful of about a dozen measures that performed best, that were most abnormal. Then we did a statistical analysis to see how those 12 measures hung together. Were they all in one family of biological abnormalities or more than one? The answer is that they fell into two very distinct families. And finally, we analyzed how all of the patients scored on those two basic abnormalities and whether those scores on the abnormalities would sort the patients into groups. And we called those groups biotypes. Not terribly original, but there you go. So what we did, in fact, is start off with a bunch of patients with um, diagnosed as having schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder and psychotic bipolar disorder. So you can imagine that each of those patient diagnostic groups contained all of the three biotypes. And we put everyone into one big jar, which we can call psychosis, since they all had symptoms of psychosis. And then we used our two major categories that we call cognitive control, sensory motor reactivity, scored everyone on those, and people fell on the result of their, those scores into three uh, biotypes. So the biomarker panel was a combination of general cognitive measures, certain kinds of eye movements, score on a stop signal task where you're not supposed to do something when you see a signal not to do it, and do something when you see a signal to do it, and the auditory uh, oddball paired stimulus test. So the first question we wanted to ask is how familial, how heritable were these two big measures? And you can see the heritability is very high in both cases. So it's 3 times 10 to the minus 19th and 7 times 10 to the minus 21st. So those are very, very highly significant. They're very, very heritable. And when we compared how you separate the different biotypes compared to how you separate the clinical diagnoses, you can see the biotypes separate very, very cleanly. The clinical diagnoses, as we saw earlier, are just a, a big smear and everything hangs together with everything else. There's no clear points of separation. So here are the biotype scores in each of the patients for the cognitive control group and the sensory motor reactivity. So the, the first thing that you might think is, A, this is just a continuum of severity. Patients with biotype 1 score least well on everything, and patients with, um, oops, let me get back. And patients with biotype 3 score most normally. But if, if you look at sensory motor reactivity, that's not true at all. If you look in the middle, over on the right, there's an H, which is where the healthy controls are scoring. And if you look at biotype 2 on this electrophysiological uh, measure, they've got an enormous spike. Not only are they not scoring lower, like biotype 1, they're scoring way higher than the healthies. And then if you look at their relatives, over on the extreme right, if you look at the twos, their relatives, just as you'd expect for an endophenotype, are also scoring way higher, whereas the relatives of biotype 1s are scoring significantly lower than the healthy controls. So you can imagine what would happen if you had a bunch of patients with a diagnosis like schizophrenia and said, OK, we've got to put all of these people together and look at their average score on this. You'd end up averaging really low scorers with really high scorers and come up with a confusing mixture that was somewhere in the middle. So this is how biotypes were distributed across DSM diagnoses. Every biotype has a mixture of every diagnosis. And um, so the obvious next questions are, can we replicate this in an independent sample? So we're lucky enough to get funding from NIH to look at another 3,000 patients to see if we can replicate this. So that's well underway. Um, can we validate this using the endophenotypes that were not used in creating the biotypes? So we've done that. And other things that never went into the biotype definitions, like MRI scan information, 
fall per perfectly into those categories. What about non-psychotic bipolar disorder? That's an experiment we've done with Alan Antichevich here from Yale. And those non-psychotic bipolar patients are completely different. And what happens when you genotype these endophenotypes and genotype the biotypes? So here's just an example of another completely separate test that we just started doing. And it falls, you can see biotype 2 is that tomato red, red color, which means they're hyperactivating, uh, just as you'd expect from all of their other electrophysiology, although this was not a defining test for biotype 2. Um, when we genotype using polygenic risk scores, the genetic profiles of the three biotypes are very different from each other. Now, I won't go into much detail because I'm running short of time, but suffice it to say, that the biotypes have ge different genetic profiles from each other, as you'd expect. Do biotypes predict individual treatment response, which is where we would, getting back to what Dr. Crystal was saying earlier, we would want to go with this. We have a couple of promising findings, particularly in biotype 2, that are related to ion channels. So we're exploring with NIH if we can look at drugs that alter permeability at particular ion channels to see if they'll help biotype 2 patients, but presumably not patients in the other biotypes. Um, so bottom line, we captured using these different endophenotypes, these heritable disease risk markers um, that were largely independent of clinical diagnosis. The biotypes had clear separations on many biomarkers, even the ones that were not used to define them. There is um, not support for a classic Kraepelinian model where the biological measures would support con conventional diagnoses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and that this sort of bottom-up approach using biology may get us from things, diagnoses that are more like dropsy to things that are more like heart failure and liver failure that are treatable. And um, these really do suggest a kind of novel disease classification, uh, but this is in need of replication and we're actually going about doing that. So where we're headed is a model that will take us from genes to molecular biology to neural circuit function, which is what we're measuring in BSNP, to actual pathology. And that's where we want to end up. Thank you very much. So, okay, so um, Dr. Pinter just telling me we've got time for two or three questions. Yes. That's a great question. The question is the former head of the National Institute of Mental Health, Thomas Insel, um, pushed for an initiative that many of you have heard of called RDOC, Research Domain Criteria, where he wanted to underpin classic psychiatric diagnoses with these kinds of biological and other measures. Um, so yes, this fit into his schema, and he was a big proponent of us doing this. And we like to say that we came up with the idea of our doc before he did. So we call this pre-doc. <laughs> uh, other questions? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So what's this slide all about is the question. Okay. So th this is just a visual steady state 
response where you um, have EEG electrodes on your head and you're confronted with a flashing checkerboard at different speeds. And you, your brain is entrained by the flickering and comes up with its own response. The brain starts flickering is like a, a simple way of putting that at a particular frequency. And biotype 2s hyper respond to that. They have a much bigger response than do healthy controls, as do their unaffected first degree relatives. So it's just another electrophysiological biological measure. And th this paper was published within the last week. And the, the first author is, is a guy called Matthew Hutchins Haney, or Matt, um, who is at the University of Georgia in Athens. So if, if you look up Hudgens Haney on, um, on PubMed, you can find this paper. And it describes it in a lot more detail than I'm able to do. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm sorry, we're good. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> oh, all right, okay. Okay. Okay, so th th that's like a really, really important question, which is if, if you have a family member who's diagnosed with one of these diagnoses, such as bipolar disorder, I guess what you're really asking is, are these biological tests helpful in, sort, in underpinning that diagnosis? So the, the answer is really no, that um, although Krapelin hoped that biological measures would give us absolute certainty in the usual diagnostic scheme, that they really don't, and that patients with bipolar illness look very similar to patients with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. So the, the biology is helpful in some ways, coming up with these biotype diagnoses. It's not helpful for people with conventional diagnoses. 